Greetings everyone. Welcome to Limits Part 1. The first place, the best place to start talking about calculus is to get some new language about uh, patterns and functions. Because in calculus that's pretty much what we study. Uh, we analyze functions. Okay? So let's define a limit. Okay? Basically, a limit is just a measure of an output value. It's asking the question, does a certain function meet at a certain function value? Okay? Or more like it gives a, an answer to the question that it thinks the function will do. Okay? So uh, I call limits the big gossip of the math community because here's what a limit does. It looks at every other point around a value rather than asking the value itself. So it's sitting here gossiping by, by calculating all these other numbers around it and saying, I think the function's going to go here, right? It tries to pinpoint it without actually looking at the point itself. And for most points on functions, that may seem like silliness, overkill. Why would you, you know, want to go everywhere else but ask the function value itself? Well, okay, sure. On most functions, we don't really need that at most locations, okay? But... There are a few very interesting locations that we need to have better language for discussing these certain patterns. And sometimes there's not a function value to ask to begin with. Okay, so here's how we set up a limit. We say limit, L-I-M, and then we say what X is approaching. In other words, what input value am I gossiping around? What input value am I going to try and hit right next to, but not on top of? Then, of course, you have the function or expression in question that you're taking the limit of. And then if you get an answer to your limit, that is a potential output value that the limit thinks the function will, will, will give back. And I say thinks, so, you know, real, real loosely there. Of course, a limit is not a, a sentient being. It doesn't think. But... It's what the limit is perceived to be through patterns, right? If I ask all these other people and they all say he's going this way, right? And if I ask all these other people and they say he's going this way and they meet up, well, it looks to me like, right, we perceive that it's at this certain location. And then that would be the answer to the limit. You never at once look at the actual value of what happens when you plug it in. Okay. Now, of course, sometime later, we'll talk about how we have all the actual rules that help us calculate these limits quickly. And, and sometimes it is, you know, that we'll, we'll plug things in. But that's not what the limit is meaning. Okay. And, and like I was saying, the, the benefit here is that we're getting new language to talk about certain things that didn't have a good way to be concisely discussed before just in, in a moment. We would have to go all around all over the place, kind of like I'm doing with this definition, right? Um, but now we have this new language, and we can immediately say, the limit's this, and it, it has all that meaning behind it, okay? So let's look at a couple of graphical examples first. When you look at a graph, you need to be able to pick out function values. You also need to be able to pick out a limiting value, all right? So I've given a few examples here that have both. Right here on the function labeled f, okay, I, I asked it to take the limit as x approaches negative 2. Well, here's negative 2 on the x-axis right here. So the limit is trying to draw close to that. That's the limit acting right there. And the pattern, the output that it's getting is that the function is doing this, right? All of these are y values and they're, and they're being calculated and they're all gossiping and they're saying, no, he's going here, no, he's going here, he's going here. And they're all in agreement, okay? They all agree he should be right there. We didn't actually look at the function value, okay? But they both agree he should be at two. So two is the answer to the limit because that's what it looks like it's going towards on the y value, okay? Now, as it turns out, if I just plug negative two into the function, I also get two, okay? So that's, that's completely possible that the limit and the function value agree. In fact, in a few lectures, you'll find out that that's a lot of times what we like to see because that gives us something called continuity. 
Next, the limit of the function f as x approaches 3. Well, here's 3 right here, so the limit is doing this, right? It's approaching 3 from both sides. And then this is what the gossip is saying. It looks like he's going up here. Hey, it looks like he's going up here, right? They're both pointing together to this location. Now remember, I'm not actually looking at that location as far as the function is concerned, okay? The actual function is not there. It's open hole. There's no function value there. So f of 3 is actually undefined. But the limit value is 5 because 5 is the y value of the location that the pattern is suggesting that the function is approaching towards, right? It's a perceived guess. The limit is like, well, it looks like he's going there because all these people said this and all these other people said this, right? So he's gossiping, but is he actually there? No, okay? So just like gossip, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, but the limit itself still gives me some information even if there is no function value there. It is giving me the pattern of what the function is doing. It, it's all approaching this point. There just doesn't happen to be a point there. So you see how we now have new language to discuss even a point right here that's undefined, something that doesn't exist on the function, and we would have stopped there originally. But now the limit gives us another little piece of information. In fact, a, a more than just one little, right? It gives us the pattern of everything around it. So we have this new language for these new patterns here, okay? And then here's something else. I can now talk about infinities without being a little bit afraid of is, is the math not going to work out or being afraid of is my language going to sound weird? Because remember, infinity we can't actually use as a number. You never use infinity to plug into a function, right? There is no such a thing as f of infinity. Because infinity is not a number, it's a concept, okay? However, limits have the ability to use infinity kind of like it's a number. Why? Because the limit doesn't actually go to the location. It uses patterns and it uses the, the idea that it's approaching something. And you can approach infinity all you want, right? That's the whole idea of infinity. So limits actually have the ability to talk about infinities in a way that function notation can't, right? I can't do f of infinity. I can do the limit as x goes off to infinity or the limit as x approaches infinity of the function, okay? So there is no function value because I can't get to infinity, but there is a limiting value because as you can see, my function wants to hug the axis. There's a, there's a horizontal asymptote there, right? My function wants to get to this point right here. And so I can actually say the limit as this function goes out forever is zero. Because if it ever could get to infinity, it would actually hit the axis. Otherwise, it's, it's always like a little bit above it, okay? But that limit gives me a lot of language to talk about there, okay? Now look at G right here. Here's an example of when a limit isn't defined, and that also gives us some information, okay? Notice I'm taking the limit of g as x gets close to 2, right? As it gets close to 2 here from both sides, x is getting close to 2. Well, what's the y value doing of g? Well, from the left-hand side, it's down here, and then all of a sudden it's broken. And from the right-hand side, it's way up here. And then that actually has the dot. So the function value is one. G of two is actually one, because there it is, okay? But then what's the limit? Well, there's not, a, there's not one mode of gossip here, right? Uh, all these people are saying, no, 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 he went this way. And all these other people up here are going, no, 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 he's up that way. They don't agree. You can't get an idea of, well, wait, is the function here? Is the function there? Uh, what is this pattern telling me? It's not one pattern. It's multiple patterns. So there's no limit. A limit is supposed to be the idea of that it's honing in on a, on a location, and this one doesn't do that, okay? So again, even though it's undefined and you're like, oh, that's a bust, it's not. That's important information. 
the fact that the limit is undefined here, but that there is a function value, that all of that language together means something that rather than just giving the function value, right? It means that it is broken, but I still have a function value, okay? So limits do a lot for us as far as our abilities to communicate what a function is looking like it's going to do, patterns all around it, and beyond that, things that we couldn't talk about before or better ways to describe things uh, that we didn't have before. Now let's actually calculate some limits. We're not going to use any rules or anything like that. We're actually going to perform the gossip that a limit does. And basically what this is, is the real raw limit. In any case, in the future, if you run into a limit that any of our rules or other things don't work, the very bottom rung of, okay, I guess I'm going to have to do it, is this. Okay, this is really what the limit is doing. This is really how the limit evaluates itself, um, given the, the, the definition that we have. Okay, so if you, th this is a, a drawn out process for each one, but it does always give you some sort of idea and probably an answer every time, um, even the, you know, with the more complicated things. So, numerical limits, all, it, all we're doing is we're going to pick some x values, plug them in, and chug out some y values. It's basically the same old plug and chug from back when you first learned to graph. That's all it is. But we're just we're using specific points and looking for a specific pattern in the output, or in our case, the y values. Okay? You're probably going to want a time saver for this one. Calculator, I mean. Right? All right, so... The limit as x approaches 4 of 9x minus 7. So what I'm doing is I've put 4 sort of as my center. But remember, I'm not plugging 4 in because that's not actually what a limit does. A limit talks to everybody else around him. Okay? Now, we could be here for hours trying to talk to everybody, um, a lot of hours. But what we're going to do is we're going to try and get a good... Uh, efficient slice of values that are sufficiently close and by that I mean don't you know start way away and then get closer we're gonna go ahead and start off kinda close and then just see what happens as we get even a little bit closer right so how close is sufficiently close I don't know pick a decimal that's really close already and then just push a little bit further every time uh, that usually doesn't uh, steer you wrong and you've got a time saver to do all of the crunching to get you through it quick anyway. Okay, so here we go. For my x values here, I, I'm going to want to pick stuff on either side of 4. That's why 4 is my center. All right. So from the left-hand side here, I'll pick something like 3.8 maybe. Right? And then to get a little closer, you could pick 3.9. But since I'm only picking three numbers, I'll go even closer, right? Let's do 3.99. And then to get a lot closer, 3.9999. Now, I know what you're going to argue. Why don't I just do three point infinite number of nines or 3.9 with a line, right? Nine with a line over it. What you have to remember is that in our crazy number system, I can actually prove that if you have an infinite number of nines, it's not approximately four, that's equal to four. So don't go that close, okay? This should be quite sufficient, all right? From the other side, right, from this side, maybe I'll start with 4.1, then I'll go 4.01, and then maybe 4.0001, right? So that's, that's getting closer to four on both sides there. Let's do some number crunching, right? Okay. So I have nine times 3.8 minus seven, 27.2. Okay, 
Now you just go up, change the 3.8 to 0.99, 28.91, right? Okay. Now just insert again, a couple of more nines, so it's 3.9999, and I have 28.999. One. See a pattern there, aren't you? Every time I put more nines here, I kind of get more nines there, right? So you, you should get that feeling that from this side, it looks like it's hitting up close to 29, right? Because 28 and you got a bunch of nines afterwards. And if I keep going here, you can see the repeated pattern getting closer there, right? More nines here is more nines there, right? Okay, let's come from this direction. I'm going to change this to 4.1 and I get 29.9. So it's coming from the upper side this time, right? Okay. Now I'm going to insert a zero, 4.01, 29.09. Okay. And then lastly, insert a couple more zeros. I get 29.0009. So again, you're seeing that pattern continue. When I add more zeros, I add more zeros here, which gets it even closer and closer to 29 from this side. Both of the sides agree it's 29, so the answer to the limit is 29. Okay? And that's basically doing a numerical limit. Let's go through and look at some of the more interesting ones, though, okay? Because, yeah, it's obvious, right? If I plugged 4 into here, 9 times 4 is 36, minus 7 is 29, that was a trivial one, right? The trivial ones are always sort of overkill with limits, but it gives us language still to, to talk about them, right? The ones where it's not overkill are a few of these that I want to talk about here, where things get more interesting when I couldn't just plug the 2 in and, and get an answer for that, right? Uh, and so on and so on. Maybe the limit will give me something, maybe it won't. Okay, so on either side of two, right? Let's do 1.9, 1.99, and 1.49s. And from the right side of two, let's do what we did before. We'll do 2.1, 2.01, 2.0001, right? Okay. So then I'll start plugging in some numbers here. And this is what we're getting. At the left hand side, as I go 1.9, 1 1.99, 1 1.9999, right? I'm getting this repeating pattern with four and a bunch of nines after it. But you'll notice every time I put more nines here, I get more zeros in front of the four, right? No zeros, one zero, three zeros, and then the four and a bunch of nines, okay? So even though they're getting more nines, it's more important to notice that I'm getting a bunch of zeros before the four. Every time I increase my nines, I get more zeros in front of the four there, right? So from the left-hand side, it's completely shrinking to zero, okay? So from the left-hand side, right, the y value is going to zero. From the right-hand side, 2.1, 2.01, 2.001, starts out with 0.51. I still have the five and the one here, but notice I've got some zeros separating them, 0.0501. And then if I get even closer, I have point zero 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 and then five and zero 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 and one so again the more zeros I put in between the decimal and the one here to make it closer the more zeros I get up at the front in front of the five so it keeps getting smaller just in size in general so again this is going to zero so both sides agree that this is going to be a limiting value of zero for the output there okay next the square root of x minus 5 over x minus 25. 
Okay, the limit as x goes to 25, so 25 is my middle. From the left, I'll be using 24.9, and I'll continue to get closer, 24.99 and 24.39s. From the right-hand side, I'll use 25.1, and then I'll continually use zeros to get closer and closer. Zero, zero, one there, right? Okay. Let's put these in the calculator. Okay, so notice from this side, after I put in the 24.9, I got 0 .1001. Then I put more nines, I got more O's in between the ones, 1001. More nines, more O's, 100001. So as you can see, every time I get closer here with more nines, I'm getting these ones further apart with more zeros. This thing is approaching 0.1, a tenth. From the other side, it's even less obvious uh, because we, we this thing converges on the value pretty quick. Converges is another catchword, right? It, it hones in on this number pretty quick uh, for this particular calculation. So you need to decipher this. Uh, and if it doesn't make sense, you can always plug in uh, further away points if, if, you need, if you need help clearing up the pattern a little bit. Okay, but notice I've got 0 0.0999, 0 0999, 0 0999 in front of each one. So it's getting closer. It's just what's after the last nine every time. I have 002, 0002, and then nothing, right? It's getting closer and closer to the, the point one also here. So point one or one tenth, if you will. Okay. On the rest of these, I took the liberty of picking the numbers. And what I'm gonna do real quick is go ahead and plug them all in so that we can more effectively discuss this without eating up a bunch of time uh, with you just watching me punch stuff in the calculator, okay? So I'm gonna plug numbers into all of these and then we'll discuss them. Okay, so let's discuss this limit now. Limit as x is approaching four. So from both sides, I've got the, the 3.7, the 3.9, 3.99, I'm just getting closer to four, right? 4.3, 4.1, 4.001. And then look really closely at these Y values here, right? Negative 0 0.0425, negative 0 0.04, should be an O there, negative 0 0.04081. It went from 4.2 to 4.0. And then from here, 400, okay? So from this side, you can tell the, the decimals after the four are just starting to skirt away further and further. I'm getting this negative 0.04 from this side. From this side right here, I have negative 0.0377, negative 0.039, negative 0.30999. It's getting closer and closer to wanting to round that three up to four. So as you can tell from both sides, it wants to agree. It should be negative 0.04 for that limit right there, okay? All right, on this next one right here, it's a, a sort of a different approach here. Uh, it's a limit of a function still, but it's a piecewise function, okay? So you have to be careful where you're picking your values from uh, given where your uh, x value might be, and of course, the one interesting place for putting a limit on a piecewise function is gonna be on the value where the x's split their decision between the different pieces. That's gonna always be an interesting part to put a limit, because sometimes those piecewise functions are broken, sometimes they're together, and the limit gives us the language of talking about that kind of continuity, okay? So of course, limit as x approaches negative three, I'm gonna split it on the left-hand side by negative 3.1, negative 3.01, negative 3.001, and on the right-hand side, negative 2.9, negative 2.99, negative 2.999. Remember, this is the negative side of the number line, right? So it feels like we're counting backwards, and you, you kind of are, right? Uh, because the more negative is, is, is the lesser here. Okay, so again, you'll notice 
here when I'm plugging in these negative 3.1, negative 3.01, these are all values that are less than negative three, right? It's from the left, okay? So keep in mind that on this side right here, I am only using the 2x plus 1 as my plug-in. I'm going to plug these values into the 2x plus 1 because they obey this particular decision. Whereas on the right side over here, I'm going to plug them into the negative 8 minus x because these are values greater than negative 3 and they only obey that decision. Okay, But either way, it, they, they have slightly different numbers, but it's pretty much the same pattern. You can see the negative 5.2, 0.02, 0.002, 0.1, 0.01, 0.001. As they get closer, both of them agree this thing is approaching negative 5. This is the overall value of that limit. Okay, And it very easily could have been two completely different values that they'd be approaching, right? Because piecewise functions don't have to meet up. This particular one, they do meet up at an open circle, right? Because when x is negative 3, it actually has a point up at, at 9. So it is sort of broken, but these two left and right pieces do meet. So the limit does exist. Okay. However, in this next example, the limit's going to be undefined. Take a look at the values. Uh, from either side, you'll notice all I'm getting is 1s. And that's because any number over itself, right, x minus 2 over x minus 2, the size is going to always be 1. But the absolute value sometimes is going to take away a negative. So on any of the sides where it's less than 2 and this is a negative value, the top, the absolute value, makes it not negative, and the bottom stays negative. But they're the still the same number size. So you're getting nothing but negative 1. Whereas on the other side, the number minus 2 is positive, and the absolute value still gives a positive over a positive, so you're getting 1. What that means is, from the left-hand side, the y values approach negative 1. And from this side, the right-hand side, the y values approach 1. These don't agree. You're getting two different versions of gossip. So I have to say this is undefined. There is no one pattern that these can agree to. Uh, it was kind of like the graph you saw earlier where I had the two pieces that were broken like that. It's just like that. Okay? So I can give you a taste of the GeoGebra that we'll be using throughout this series. I want to show you the graphs of these limits that we were just discussing. The first one was the limit uh, as x approaches 4 of 9x minus 7 up here. So here's the graph, of course it's a line. And as you can see, x equals four is right here. And it very, very closely hits this point up here at 29, you can see right here. If I type in the point for 29, you'll see. That's exactly where it's hitting. And as it's approaching from either side, you can see all of the points lead up to that value. Okay, next. Let's look at the limit as x goes to 2 of the x cubed minus x squared minus 8x plus 12 all over x minus 2. The graph of this one looks a lot nicer than you'd expect. And if I type in 2 and 0 here, right, that's the location we're expecting. As a matter of fact, the way this graph should look is there should be this point there. The graph should actually look like this when you're graphing this thing because it's not a perfect parabola. Because of the division by zero, there should actually be a hole in that spot right there. Okay? And as the limit suggests, the the all of the points from both sides show that it does actually meet up 
at y equals zero there. All right. Next we have the square root of x minus five over x minus 25, which looks like this. And we need to look at this one all the way over at 25, right? Let's see, I can get this to expand a bit, quite a bit. And as we said before, there should be a hole in this graph because of the division by zero right here. There should be a hole in it. Uh, it doesn't really want to go. I have to force it. Right there. There should be a hole here. And that's actually the point we were interested in in the limit anyway, right? From the left and from the right, you can see it does actually meet up at 0.1 for a y value there, right? And so that's actually what the limit is telling us without ever going to the point, right? Both sides are leading up to that y value. All right, let's uh, level out this guy a bit. Back to the normal grid. And the next one was as x approaches 4 of 1 over x plus 1 minus 1 fifth all over x minus 4. Okay, so as x approaches 4 here, right, we're getting the 4 and it was negative 0.04. Right, right there. You can see that that's exactly where the limit is leading us right there to the negative point zero four there on both sides. Right? Okay, and then next was a piecewise function. The piecewise function is going to look all broken up like this. It would look a little bit more broken if the pieces didn't meet. But you have to remember, technically, there should be a hole here because there's no equals on either of these pieces. And this other point should actually exist way up here. Right here. This is what the graph would truly look like. It would look like these two pieces here, right, merged up down here with a hole in between them, and then the other point way up here. Because when x is negative 3, it's supposed to equal 9. So I have that point right, uh, right there representing that single middle piece. But then also at negative three, negative five is where the two other pieces meet up, but they don't equal, so there's a hole in between them. But remember, we took the limit as x approaches negative three. So really, it's gonna be looking at both of these two pieces. It doesn't know anything about this point up here. It's simply gonna follow the pattern here and here and see that they meet up at the y value of negative 5. Then, uh, hence, the, the limit is negative 5. Okay, then the last one is the absolute value of x minus 2 over x minus 2. And as you can see, it looks like we were discussing before, it's the two broken pieces. So as you can see, from both sides, the patterns don't agree here, right? And, and there's no function value because you can't divide by zero. To finish up this part one of my introduction to limits for you, I wanna just uh, introduce you to three limits that are gonna come up in a lot of different places, very special limits. Uh, and this will be our first treatment of them. We'll also go through the analytical side in the next couple of lectures, and you'll see exactly why these things do end up the way they do. But bottom line, we can still do the numerical limits just like we were doing on these special limits too. You might recognize this limit if you've ever done a lot of the compounded interest type of formulas. This is the limit that connects the normal compounding to the continuous compounding formulas. Uh, the limit as x goes to infinity, 
so we're only you know going off to the right on the x-axis here of 1 plus 1 over x all quantity raised to the x power now I know what you should be thinking we're gonna let that exponent become a very large number right so the the limit is actually going to describe something that is counterintuitive that the fact that the exponent is trying to get as large as possible does not mean that this is going to grow unbounded okay so here's the limit I let my X just count by zeros here basically one ten hundred thousand ten thousand and then I skip to a million okay plugging in one straightforward you can just get two immediately by plugging in one if you plug in 10 1 plus 1 over 10 raised to the 10 you get 2.59 ish plug in 100 2.704 then 2.716 if you plug in 1,000, 2.7181 if you plug in 10,000, and then when you plug in a million, 2.71828. Uh, this should start sounding a little bit familiar to you. 2.71828 is the first few digits of a very special number, right? 2.71828.1 and then another 8 after that would actually be the value of the natural number E. This limit is equal to the value of E, the natural number, okay? So now, a couple of trig limits that come up. Um, don't forget that all of the trig that we'll be dealing with in calculus, especially when we're doing function analysis, we'll be doing it in radians. Every once in a while, we might throw some degrees out there if we're drawing a picture or something like that. But whenever the analysis comes in, the best way to relate trig to our uh, analysis world is through radians because it is a naturally built system. Okay, so uh, limit is x goes to zero of sine x over x. Uh, a classic comparison of a transcendental and a uh, polynomial there two things that don't normally mix, right? However, when you plug in some values and get closer to zero on both sides, it approaches the same value as you go. Look, 0 0.84, 0 0.95, 0 0.998, right? Same thing on this side. Both of these sides are approaching one. You get much closer and it's just gonna be a bunch of 0 0.99999s the closer you get, okay? Very important limit that's gonna come up a lot, limit of sine x over x okay similar something that comes up a lot in in some of our proofs that we'll need uh, is the limit as x goes to zero of one minus cosine x over x so again i plug in this side uh the the negative side this time isn't like the last time it actually gives negatives but you'll notice the the negative side and the positive side are all giving the same sizes it goes from 0.45 to 0.049 to 0.0049. Same thing on the other side. It's just putting more zeros and more space between the decimal and that four. It's just gonna keep getting smaller and smaller with more zeros. So from both sides, this one does actually hit zero, okay? I hope this definition and first treatment of numerically analyzing limits has helped you understand what a limit is, okay? Part two we'll break it down even more. So another quick look at these things so that you can um, see the graphical side of what's going on. Uh, that first limit, one plus one over x raised to the x, graph looks like this. And we were interested only as x goes to infinity. So x was gonna take off towards the right right here, going this way. And I have this dashed line for you to see. This is where the value of E is, 2.718 right there and I'm gonna squish up this axis so that you can see what happens the further it goes out right I squish up that x-axis and you can see it just keeps getting closer and closer practically becomes one with the line almost if it could ever actually get to infinity it would actually meet up with that line so as x goes to infinity this thing is putting out the value uh, of E Okay, so let's standardize this thing back out again. All right, next, 
let's look at this sine x over x. In real quick inspection, you can see as it goes to zero from both sides, it's the middle of this hump here, right? Technically, there should not be an actual value there. There should be a hole in the graph. The, the GeoGebra is just not capable of, of fathoming the, the hole being the size of an infinitesimal point. So it just doesn't draw it. But technically, there should be a hole here. But the limit doesn't care about that. You can see the limit pieces meet up at 1. And the last one we did was the 1 minus cosine x over x. Again, you can see it's in the middle of this swirl piece here. Both the left and the right do agree at 0. Uh, technically, there should be a hole there because you can't divide by 0. But again, the limit doesn't care about that. The two pieces from either side meet up there.